Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 20th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? Apologies have been received from Gillian Martin, and I welcome Claire Adamson, who is attending as a substitute. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take items of business in private. Firstly, is everyone content that item six of this meeting be taken in private? Secondly, do members agree to consider the draft report on school infrastructure in private at future meetings? Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item of business is the third and final evidence session of the committee's inquiry into school infrastructure. This, this inquiry is focusing on the lessons to be learned from the incidents at Oxgangs Primary School in January 2016. To date, the committee has heard from representatives of local authorities in the construction industry and Professor John Cole, the author of a report into school closures in Edinburgh. This week, we we have a hearing from the Scottish Government and Scottish Futures Trust, and I welcome to the meeting Kevin Stewart, MSP, Minister for Local Government and Housing, Bill Dodds, Head of Building uh, Standards, Andrew Daly, Head of School Building Team, Scott Bell, Head of Procurement and Construction, who are all from the Scottish Government, and Peter Rieke, Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Investments from the Scottish Futures Trust. As I mentioned last week, it's important to note that there's an ongoing fatal accident inquiry relating to the accident at Liberton High School in 2014. We'll therefore avoid discussion on specifics of that accident to ensure this committee does not impinge on the work of the FAI by exploring matters which may be sub -judice. And I understand the Minister will make a short statement. Uh, very briefly, Convener, I'd like to start by thanking the Education and Skills Committee for the invitation to appear today, and I very much welcome your inquiry into uh, this very important issue. Uh, I hope the, the committee will agree, uh, particularly given the detail within the written evidence provided by the Government and Scot Scottish Futures Trust, uh, that we have not been complacent with regards to the swift action uh, we took immediately after the Edinburgh Schools issue first materialised. Uh, and subsequently the steps we have taken since uh, the independent inquiry into the construction of Edinburgh Schools published its report in February. Uh, importantly, I understand that uh, the committee has already heard evidence from Professor John Cole, a number of local authorities and representatives from the construction industry. I very much welcome this uh, and as I'm sure the committee will strongly agree, uh, we must all work together uh, to understand the full implications of these failings in our public buildings and schools and learn any lessons from all of our findings into these issues. I'm absolutely committed uh, to putting in place all the necessary requirements, legislative or otherwise, uh, so that none of the public buildings and schools let down our pupils, teachers and parents in such a manner again. Uh, thanks again for having me here today and I'm happy to take your questions, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, can I start off by asking a question before I, I uh, pass you over to my colleagues? Uh, do you agree with the Cole report that the quality assurance procedures were inadequate? And if so, should the Scottish Government look at local authorities to implement a standardised approach to the quality assurance in future capital projects? I think in the case of the Edinburgh schools, the quality assurance uh, was not what it should have been. Um, and, you know, I am absolutely adamant that we get this right. And that's why I said in my opening statement, um, convener, uh, that I'm willing to look at uh, any means, legislative, uh, regulatory or otherwise, to make sure that we get this absolutely um, right. Um, I have met uh, just the other week with 30 of the 32 local authorities uh, to discuss uh, this issue uh, in more depth. Um, what I am very much aware of is that um, quality um, in certain places uh, it seems to have been much better uh, because those councils have chosen to continue to use clerks of work um, for all schemes. Um, and I think that there are lessons to be learned there. Um, I will look extremely closely at your findings as a committee, um, as well as uh, look at the work that we have been doing across the board as government and with the help of uh, the uh, Scottish Futures Trust too, uh, to make sure that we put everything in place to make sure that we get this absolutely right. Uh, thank you for that. Just a, a short supplementary. The, you say that you spoke to 13 out of 32 and the, the ones with clerks of works 
showed that they had the highest safety standards, I suppose, uh, would be appropriate? Well, I think uh, it would be fair to say, convener, from uh, the readout of that meeting, um, which I've looked at very closely, um, those authorities that had clerks of work um, in uh, all, project, all projects seemed to have very little difficulties at all uh, in terms of um, the, 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 the situations with their schools and public buildings. I think that that um, probably tells a tale. Obviously, we'll do some more in-depth analysis into that. Uh, but I think uh, the broad, uh, my broad view would be that those authorities who had clerks of work on every job seemed to do much better than those that did not. And this would cut across uh, the method of financing for projects as well? Uh, yes. Um, I think there were a number of councils which, uh, where they stated uh, that no matter what type of uh, finance was used, they had a clerk of works on the job. Thank you very much. And that takes me neatly on to Liz. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just to pick up on that point, Minister, um, we obviously had very considerable discussions uh, about the type of finance that might be appropriate. And Professor Cole hinted that it's not so much about the source of the finance, it's about overseeing how that finance is spent. And uh, as you have rightly just said, that in terms of the scrutiny of the procedures, that's the important bit. D does the Scottish Government have a view about uh, the appropriate sources of finance, or do you think this debate is very much more about how it is spent and the oversight of ensuring that uh, all the checks are made? You're right to say that Professor Cole in his report said that this was not down to the financial uh, model uh, that was used. Um, I, I mean, I could sit here um, for ages, convener, as well as many others, to um, talk about the failings as I perceive them to be with PFI PPP. I'm not going to do that, you'll be um, glad to hear. Um, but he um, said in the report that it was uh, not necessarily the financial model. Um, it was not the financial model that caused these difficulties. However, in saying that, uh, I think that um, you know, in terms of the model itself. I think some uh, local authorities uh, were maybe a little bit lax in thinking that all of the risk went on to the body that was carrying out the work. Hmm. Um, now, you know, um, you could say that the body would have the financial risk and that, you know, folk could understand. But um, as far as I'm concerned, um, that the risk in terms of the building standards and the delivery of the project to make sure that it's absolutely right does not rest with that other body. That still rests with the local authority um, or other, um, or other uh, body which is, uh, is contracting that work. I ask the question because obviously if the debate is about the type of finance and how that's managed, then that's a slightly different debate that we have to have from one where it doesn't seem to matter where the source of the finance is, but how it's uh, overseen in its, um, its spending. But just, just to pick up an interesting point you made just now about the responsibility element, because I think it's pretty clear from the evidence that we've taken and from what the Scottish Government has said so far, that it is about the responsibility lying with people who will be on the job permanently and with the absolute uh, cast iron guarantees of uh, assuring that a good job is being done. If that's true, if it is about the responsibility, is it your opinion at this stage that some changes might be uh, required to ensure that that responsibility lies uh, w entirely with those who have the um, ability to de deliver the spending on that project? I think. Um I'm going to go back to the, the report itself and what Professor Cole said, because I think that puts it into context. Um, and I quote, um, he says, there's no reason why properly managed, uh, privately financed public sector buildings uh, should not be capable of delivering buildings constructed to a very high standard if best practice approaches to ensuring the quality of design and construction are properly incorporated. Uh, beyond that, um, the report is clear. Um, the fundamental failure uh, was in construction, uh, quality and supervision. Um, 
There are wide-ranging uh, recommendations in, in that report, and I'm sure that the committee have studied uh, in depth. And those focus especially around construction supervision, uh, which uh, has a, a relevance to, to financing and procurement approaches. But you know, the, the construction supervision here is the key. Um, and that goes, uh, it's construction supervision uh, across the board. It is construction industry themselves making sure uh, that the work that is being carried out um, complies with the very rigorous standards that we have got. Um, it is uh, also, uh, in my opinion, uh, the duty of the, the, the body who have uh, uh, procured that building uh, to make sure um, that it is, it is going up uh, properly, safely, and to the standard that they expect. Uh, and beyond that, obviously, we have um, our building standards regime, and there should be compliance right, uh, right about that. Now, you know, the report, the core report itself, uh, was not particularly critical of our building standards regime at all. Um, but it was extremely critical in terms of those fundamental failures, in terms of construction, quality, and supervision. Uh, and it was also critical in the, the witnesses that came to this committee were critical in the fact that it was not clear about where the responsibility lied. It was too, it's too easy to shift uh, the responsibility onto somebody else. Could, could I just uh, finish my question and asking whether you, you believe that that's one of the, the most important uh, answers that you have to give as a Scottish government, uh, to be very clear about where responsibilities lie and, if necessary, to legislate on that? Um, as, as I said at the very beginning, um, convener, uh, I will look at all of this in depth. If that requires legislative change or regulatory change, we will do that. Um, and I, I, as I said at the very beginning to you, convener, I will look very closely um, at the findings from your inquiry uh, and take cognizance of that, look at that very carefully uh, and see if any of that needs to be incorporated into any changes that we make. But I think there are some simplistic changes that could happen straight away without legislative change or regulatory change. And that is um, to make sure that the right folk are overseeing um, these, these projects, no matter how they're financed, that the right folk are there on the ground to oversee those projects. Uh, and I refer again to my point about clerks of work. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Mr. Ricky, do you have any comment at this stage? Thank you very much, Convener. Well, firstly, as you say, I'm a, I'm a civil engineer, a chartered civil engineer by background and training. So I, I come at this from the view of a long time in, this, in, in the construction industry and in procurement in, in particular. And I, I think it's important to, to say also that there have been a lot of changes, as you've heard from other witnesses already, um, in, in the way we deliver buildings from the time that the Edinburgh PPP1 schools were built. What we're doing now in schools delivery is we're working on individual schools rather than large batches. So that allows there to be a focus on the individual um, development of, of what's right for any one building. As I think you heard local authorities and indeed head teachers give evidence on that before. We have now a much more detailed specification for our buildings rather than, as again you've heard before, the, the very high level output specification that left a lot of the design development um, to the industry that was the case at the time of, of PPP1. Construction methods have changed, so we're using a, a, a lot more uh, steel framing systems than the brick and block, and we're working a lot more closely with designers, clients, and contractors during the development process. And also, we, we've got a different role from SFT in supporting those authorities as they move to the handover of buildings to, to help them get what they're contractually entitled to and move to that really important stage where they're monitoring a building um, in its operation. But there are, as, as everyone's seen, varied practices um, throughout. And the Cole Report has been really helpful in, in, in highlighting those practices where um, there are different, as, we, as we've heard, monitoring regimes in place for different authorities. There are different ways that designers interact with, with construction. And there are different payment approaches throughout the, the industry. In my view, it's really important that we are able to come up with ways of delivering quality buildings that work within any of those approaches, because the industry has grown up with different approaches to procurement and delivery for some very good reasons. And all of those, as the Minister has said, are capable of being done in a high quality way with the right systems and processes and people. 
wrapped around them. So, so construction monitoring is important. There's also important points around the way designers pass their production information to the guys on the ground that have to do the building. There are some important points around how the as-built information, exactly what was, was constructed, comes back to an authority so that that can be um, retained. And all of those lessons are being learnt um, through the way we deliver right now on the ground. But there's, there's obviously more that we can do. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll now bring in Colin. Thank you, um, I've heard what Mr Riki is saying there about uh, the NPD system. The core report seems to be indicating that PPP1 is where the major issues were and where the major lack of oversight was. How did that change moving into PPP2 that it was perhaps better controlled? Convener, um, I think it's uh, often difficult to uh, look at what changes are at, at various points. That there were construction changes, for one. Um, a lot of the PPP1 schools, uh, and Mr Riti and others may uh, correct me here, that were built under uh, design and build procurement uh, methods. And I think, you know, uh, as I said earlier, I think in terms of all of that, where folks seem to think that, you know, uh, I'm handing this entire project over to someone else. Uh, they were handing over, as, as they thought, the risk as well, when they should have been monitoring um, much, much more closely. Um, in terms of, um, of uh, the methodology used in, in, in construction, they, they were different um, in PPP2. Um, and, you know, I think that that has been picked up. The design of buildings now uh, is uh, very uh, different with uh, modern approaches to building insulation and construction, uh, leading to much less frequent use of um, what has been called the brick and block construction, uh, found to be defective, which was PPP1. Um, however, in saying all of that, I'm not complacent about all of this at all. Um, and I will continue to seek um, assurance about, um, about uh, the quality arrangements that are being put in place now uh, with the new uh, techniques that are being used in terms of the construction. I, I was very interested that the local authority Building Standards Scotland uh, stated that uh, Building standards had, has no remit or no remit over the quality of the build. You know, you'd think it's in the name building standards that there would be a certain uh, degree of uh, reassurance there from building standards, and yet that didn't seem to happen. And clearly, the organisation that represents building standards is saying that is not the remit of building standards. I'll, I'll take a Mr. Dodds in a minute, if you if you don't mind, convener, um, but. The key thing in all of this, in terms of meeting those standards, in terms of the certification, it is up um, to uh, those doing the construction to make sure that they are compliant uh, with those building standards. I'll let Mr Dodds come in with a more in-depth response about how our building standard system works at this moment in time. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, the building standard system, when you talk about quality, what we're talking about there is the quality to ensure that a building is properly built. You know, the responsibility is ultimately the owner's responsibility under the Building Scotland Act. In this case, it would be Edinburgh's Education Authority. They, they have the responsibility to ensure that the way the building is constructed is in accordance with our technical standards. Now, in many cases, quality is embedded there because you need a certain quality to keep the rain out, you need a certain quality you know, to, to make sure that, that the building is adequately ventilated, for example. So there is an inherent requirement for quality in that to meet the, the, the standards. And I think that the word quality in building uh, can be used in many different forms. And for example, someone who is maybe uh, extending their, their house or putting in a kitchen or something, the quality of the way the tiles are laid or whatever. And I think that kind of um, information has been passed on to the other co committee that's looking at building standards in more detail. And they're actually asking about 
quality building standards and the role that building standards perform within the overall um, framework of the system. Um, very much the local authority building inspector or building control officer, uh, they verify the drawings at the front end to make sure that the specifications are all properly set out. It's incumbent on the owner then to build the property or the building the way they should. And then it's a last check. But as we've heard here, there are many other actors who have a role to play, the designer, the constructor, the developer. And in many respects, the, the last man standing as well as the local authority building inspector. And, uh, and I think that role, uh, from what we're hearing, uh, although there wasn't expressed criticism of, of building standards within the core report, there were some issues there that need addressing particularly around the role of building standards, the, the nature of the inspections and the consistency that local authorities are undertaking those inspections. But that's to differentiate between the role of building standards or building control, as it's called in England, and what we would say is the kind of supervisory requirement for um, building owners. Which but if I'm a guy in the street and I think about building standards, I think about safety. I think about, I think about the reassurance yeah. that building standards will protect against, uh, against a, a faulty build. And you're telling me that isn't the case? No, no, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that by any means. I've worked for 40 years in the, in the building standards system, and it's in my DNA to ensure public safety. I, I have to say that is certainly not the case. And, and in fact, fairly recent events will show you that um, the regulatory regimes within other uh, countries are being put under extreme scrutiny at the moment. I, I, I think that Scotland has, has a very good building standard system. It didn't work? Again, for all the reasons that have been set out, you know, it was about the quality of workmanship, it was about the quality of supervision. Building standards are part of the overall process, and I think that's what um, uh, the Minister is keen to explore as, a, as we go through here, that every constituent part of it um, should build to get compliant buildings at the end of the day. Look, look, looking back, would you not say that building standards seem to have been rather remote? In respect of the Edinburgh schools? In respect to the Edinburgh schools and uh, the other uh, issues that have been found in schools across Scotland. Just one, uh, Ben Stubborn, then I'll let you in. Again, what you've got to appreciate is that these are large, complex buildings that would require an almost daily presence to undertake those inspections. But the role of building standards is to ensure that the builder undertakes the, prop the proper checks and balances throughout the project. You know, I don't think an ordinary man on the street would understand that. Uh, let the Minister in and see if you can clarify. Convener, I think, you know, building standards has a, a major role to play in this. And as I said, we will look at what is required, if any change is required there. But the key thing in all of this, Convener, is the fact that building standards officers cannot be on site uh, all of the time. Um, and there is a role in terms of the regime that we have in place uh, in terms of the, those that are designing, those that are constructing, the, the owner uh, of the project, whoever that may be, they all have a role to play in ensuring the quality of that building. Uh, they um, have a responsibility to make sure that they are complying with the standards that have been laid out. As Mr Dodds rightly pointed out at the very beginning of the process, uh, building standards will look and make sure um, that the drawings and everything, all of the technicals are absolutely right. Um, if Mr Beatty is suggesting um, that um, building standards officers should be uh, on site at every project all of the time, um, you know, that uh, I don't think is, is practical at all. But that comes back to the point about the entire ownership of the situation where, you know, clerks of works seem to have worked very well in terms of the major projects to make sure okay. that there is complete and utter compliance can, can I, at every stage. Can I suggest that that's not what Mr Beatty is saying? But what Mr Beatty is saying is, well, I don't, I'm not quite sure uh, he can speak for himself, but what I took from Mr Dodd's response was that the, we're kind of not sure that what building standards is for, except for the look at the drawings at the beginning and the look at the finished item at the end. And is there any check on all those other component parts 
that you've talked about through it. That build, does building standards have a role to make sure that all those other component parts have been seen to? And if they are, then why have, them, why have some of these parts been missed? I'll let Mr Dodds come back in. Yeah, there's, there's two things there. After the building warrant is, is, is issued, there, uh, there is, well, we have a situation or a system now where the, the building standards are there along with the owner develop an inspection plan. It's called the CCNP, a Construction Compliance and Notification Plan. That's been introduced since 2012. The idea behind that is to identify the high-risk items that, uh, that, that might require inspection using the scant resource that, that local authorities have sometimes to do this kind of. So they target the high-risk um, building elements. Now, we were aware that uh, the coal report was, was, was about to be published, and we knew there would be findings from that. And I discussed with the minister about how we could update that in, in the wake of the coal report. And that's the work that we're doing just now. So essentially, what should happen is there will be a plan with the, the, the developer or the builder and the local authority that specifies the key stages of construction that they want to see. So it may be the foundations, the external walls or the roof, and so that they would work their way through that plan, being notified by the applicant of the, the particular time to look at the, the, the building or, or whatever. And then at the end of the day, there would be a completion certificate and be an inspection to make sure that the building was properly built. Now, I do know that a number of local authorities now are supplementing their building standard staff with what they call building inspectors. They're not clerk of works. But they appreciate now that the focus is now moving more towards inspection. And while it's not their, their role to be a clerk of works, they are supplementing their current building standards staff with additional resources. I was in Glasgow recently, and they've taken on two or three building inspectors. And a number of councils are changing the, the staffing structures to move them more away from the paper-based approach to assessing uh, building one applications to more of on-site presence. And again, that drives up the build quality again, that extra pair of eyes overlooking the shoulder of someone who was doing that. And I have to say, in, in Edinburgh, the situation was such that the, the work was, was almost hidden by the time someone would see it. The walls would be put up. Wall ties are very difficult to see. Um, you know, and even a cursory walk around, structural engineers weren't able to identify that it was a problem until such times so, as sorry, Mr. To do I, I don't mean to uh, interrupt here, and I know that the, my, my, two of my colleagues want to come in further to this, but if that's the case and you can't verify the work, then how can you sign it off? Well, the idea, again, it's, it's, it's a part of a process that's driven by the, the, um, the building developer who may have someone overseeing the, the inspections as far as the procurement process is concerned. You could also have, you know, there is, there is a number of processes before the building standards inspector comes along. You know, it's incumbent on the owner to make sure that their building has been built properly and they should engage proper um, uh, assurances there, and I think Peter could probably sp yeah, spell I'm going that to, out I'm a going bit to let more. Mr. Vicky in later on, but I've got yeah. a Tavish, Scott, and then Daniel Johnson. I, I, have, I have a lot of sympathy with the argument you've just made. Um, someone has built my own extension to my own house. I had building control all over me, all the way through. What I'm interested in is, is there one rule for private developers building, for, for example, a small house, and another for these large complex, as you rightly said earlier on, large complex constructions of a school, where, as far as you've all described it this morning, um, there might be three visits during the course of that school being built. Well, I have to say, I've been to a, a council fairly recently where it was 40 inspections that have been undertaken in a school. But having said that, you wouldn't necessarily find the defects that were found in the, the Oxgang schools because of the nature of the build. You know, that, that's just the part of the issue here. So I guess going forward, the lessons to learn when we were talking about identifying high risk areas, I'm quite sure that most local authorities now will have targeted wall ties. And, and certain other high-risk elements that they will be focusing their attention on now. And, and, and again, in events that have happened over the last couple of weeks, there will be a closer focus on some of the fire-related issues as yeah. well. So building standards have very much a role to play, but it's a part of an overall process. But there should be checks and balances by from the design right through to the building want approval, right through to how it's constructed. So and I think what um, Mr Stewart's suggesting here is that we are looking at a holistic approach to tackling each of those individual components so that they work 
together rather than being in siloed thinking and, and, and making sure that there's no duplication and everyone, the roles and the responsibilities are all set out properly. And that seems very sensible, but presumably, Minister, your concern is that this system didn't work, did it? Uh, I mean, this, the, these walls fell down. Uh, we, can't get a, we can't avoid the fact these walls fell down. So the system didn't work. And as my colleagues have all been saying, you know, what has building standards been doing when these walls were falling down? The system hasn't worked, has it? Uh, convener, uh, I think that, um, you know, it hasn't worked. And that's quite clear from the Coal Report uh, in terms of the entire way that that project was dealt with. Um, I go back to the point of... So what's going to happen uh, then? Well, we've already had some changes uh, in terms of uh, building standards over the piece. Um, in 2013, for example, uh, local authority building standards uh, services introduced a, a risk assessed approach to site inspections um, that targeted building elements uh, that were at the greatest risk of non-compliance. Um, and I would expect uh, those uh, building standards folks right across the country to ensure that they have got that targeted approach uh, to make sure uh, that where there is risk, they are there to make sure that things are being done right. Uh, beyond that, I think that, you know, in some regards, convener, uh, over the piece, um, building standards in, in local authorities have been somewhat of a, a Cinderella service. Um, I have, uh, in recent times, um, signed off on a, an increase in fees um, with, the, the, with the intention of allowing local authorities to invest much more um, in their building standard services uh, so that they have the people uh, to be able to carry out all of the functions um, that are required. But I think the key thing in all of this, and we, we cannot uh, escape this at all in terms of uh, responsibility, um, the building owner themselves, uh, or uh, the building owners in terms of authorities, are ultimately responsible for compliance. Um, that responsibility is theirs. There are other parts of the system, yeah, including but... building standards, which will look at very closely what is going on. But ultimately, in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh, construction of a project, the owner or is ultimately responsible for that compliance. And I don't think anyone's disagreeing with that. Well, you've said that a number of times, Minister, and I think the committee gets that and understands that, but all you're really seeing there is welcome to the world of law, because all that means is, is we're into the High Court or, or whatever. So fear be it. doesn't help Daniel Johnson's pupils who all, who all, whose wall fell down. So, I mean, great, we're into law. Can I ask, uh, I wonder if I could ask the Scottish Futures Trust, if you don't mind, Mr. Rickey, um, it, this system now all works. Is it such that when you're building schools across Scotland, for example, um, the, the kind of things that your colleagues have here have been describing is in place? In other words, there's Clark of Works um, regularly on site, regularly looking at these projects so that the wall ties that we were told about in graphic detail the other day are going in far enough into the blocks so the darn walls don't fall down. It's, I've started to talk about the changes that have happened since PPP1 and we can talk about inspection monitoring, and I will do so, but I think it's important to look at the whole system of developing and delivering building assets. So we need a, a, a well-considered strategy by an intelligent client in, in, in customer procuring authorities that understand from whichever way they go about procuring and indeed funding their, their buildings, they understand the contractual structure they're entering into, what they can rightfully expect a contractor to do and what they need to do for themselves. But is that not so your the, job? So You're the client. We provide a framework. From, yeah. We're not the client. The local authorities are the client. Well, you're kind of client. our client because you're so, building these schools on behalf of us, the, the parliament and, and, and the government. So we, we set up a, a framework within which those can be delivered. Okay. And that, that way of working, as I said before, is much more about the individual development of schools rather than a focus on, on large batches. We use a more detailed specification so there's a lot more engagement between the users of the building and the designers and the contractors. There's a, a, a partnership approach which allows that team to work together throughout the development stage before it gets on site rather than that being at quite an arm's length through a competitive procurement mm -hmm. process as was the case in, in PPP1. There's a lot of changes to construction technology so whilst there are some, still some brick and block walls for very good reasons, 
where in a gym hall, for example, you might need a, a brick facing because of what the planners require, and you might need a block internal wall to get the right rebounds for your, for your balls. Most cases, that construction system isn't used in different, in, um, different approaches. Then we have the, the supervision and monitoring. And as, as you heard last week, different local authorities have taken different approaches um, to monitoring over a number of years. And all of our contract approaches that we, that we use in SFT allow for clerks of works to be, to be included. Some authorities have used them, some have not. Uh, what we're why, doing now... Why would there be the difference there? Because I think we found that's a very strong piece of evidence. The Minister's reflected that as well. Is it because these budgets are so tight that the, the contractors don't have the money to employ clerk it, of works? It's not about contractors employing clerks of works. It's about the procuring authority having that team in place to, to deliver buildings in that way. they've got to have way. a budget for that. And, well... They've got to employ those people, don't they? So local authorities, if they're the client, health boards, if they're the client, different public bodies um, need to have a, a total budget for their organisation and a budget for their projects. I, I agree with you. But just in terms of improving a system, which we all agree needs some work on it, is, do you not think the Scottish Futures Trust might have a role in that? Because, because these are your schools being yep. built all over Scotland. Do you not think you should have a monitoring role in terms of what's happening? So I, I think it, on individual building sites, I don't think the Scottish Futures Trust is the right organisation okay. to deploy clerks of works across building sites okay. all around no, that's Scotland. That's fine. I totally get that. But who is then? That should be the individual authority that's procuring the building. And they can have that through a directly employed team. As you heard last week, many authorities carry that as an in-house resource. Sure. Okay. Or it can be engaged on a project-by-project project basis. If it's an entity no, that's that does less that's procurement, it. they can contract for it. I agree with that. So who pays for it? Basis. That would need to be part of either the ongoing running cost of the organisation, if they're like a serial procurer, and they have that as a, a, a team in-house, or it could be built into the project cost if they're a less frequent in, um, procurer and need to engage that service on a project-by-project project Thank basis. you. So it could be built into the project cost. That would be part of a, a sensible way forward on these kind of projects. Yeah, either way, it can, yeah. be, it can okay. be done, yeah. Thank you. Follow up on the, these points around building control. I mean, Mr Dodds, you, you, you spelt out why the construction methodology meant that it wasn't able to check, but surely that's uh, exposed to the deficiency. Surely if we have a building control regime, it's there to detect faults, and, and that hadn't worked. And, and more to the point, Professor Cole said that there wasn't the capacity for building control to do more than verify the specification. There wasn't the capacity there to check whether or not it had been implemented. He wasn't saying that was historic. He was saying that was current. I was just wondering if you could re re reflect on those two points. Oh. Shorter, please, because we've got a lot to get through. And, and... Yeah, OK. okay. So uh, the, the, I'm trying to get this as short as possible. But I mean, at the end of the day, yes, the, the resources and local authority, as, as the minister's pointed out, if we're talking about today, the schools were built something like 10, 15 years ago, at a time when they were being built in, in bulk. And there was a different kind of uh, system in place. So there was a sh probably a time of a building boom, probably a shortage of uh, skilled workers. Um, there was a whole range of uh, issues that were probably surrounding the, the construction of those schools at that time. And again, there would be a, a need to, to, to build these schools um, um, pretty quickly, I would imagine, and uh, Mr Cole has, has explained that in his report about some of the, the construction methods that were there. So as far as building standards are concerned, yes, they're a, they're a final check. You know, they, are, they check the building warrant specification, make sure everything is, is a preemptive system we have in Scotland. It's on the drawings, everything should be built exactly the way it should be built. Um, if, if, if it follows the drawings and the specification, the local authority only need to take certain checks to make sure things are being built properly. Okay. And um, it may well be, as, 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 but apparently, if you look at the Cole report again here, there were quite a number of inspections carried out in those schools, but sure. uh, a number of them seem to focus on, on drainage and other items, and that is why we changed the process to looking at high-risk items. Sure from then on in. So. So, so can I just put this point to the Minister then? I mean, re reflecting on that, despite all of that, those checks, by your own definition, failed. D don't people have a right to expect that if buildings have gone through the building control regime, that they're safe? And, and you know, frankly, saying that the owners have to take responsibility isn't good enough. What's the point of the building control regime if it's not picking up on these faults? 
Well, the point of the building control regime, um, uh, convener, is to make sure um, that what is being built uh, complies with the standards, the, the very robust standards that we have. And there are always uh, room for improvement, but we do have uh, fairly robust standards in terms of Scottish building standards uh, regime. Um, building standards service itself, as I, I pointed out earlier, uh, has changed in terms of uh, uh, the way it operates in terms of dealing uh, with uh, those areas where there's deemed to be greatest risk. As, as Mr Dodds has pointed out, um, in the past, uh, and Professor Cole pointed that out in terms of the Edinburgh schools, um, there was a focus on things which were not were not um, as important, like the drains that, uh, uh, that uh, Mr Dodds mentioned. That has changed in terms of, of the, the regime that has taken place. Again, convener, um, in terms of looking at this as a whole, um, you know, if there is any other um, uh, situations which I think requires change, um, then we will do so. Um, and I come back to the point that I made earlier about investment, um, because there needs to be that investment uh, in building standards uh, across Scotland. Uh, there needs to be improvement um, in certain areas uh, where building standards has not been as good as it should be. Um, another thing which I did recently was um, to uh, allow um, uh, local authorities to have the verification um, contracts for a number of years. Normally that would be um, six years that the minister would sign off on. Um, in the case, in this case, this time, um, the good performing authorities who were doing well in terms of building standards, I allowed to the six years. Those that were doing not so well, three years, and we will revisit them. And three authorities, which I think are not doing well, where I've sent Mr Dodds <coughs> and his team to give them advice on what needs to be done, they have one year. Uh, and those three authorities are Stirling, Glasgow and Edinburgh. So can I just confirm, by saying that you're saying there needs to be investment, that you're agreeing with Professor Cole that there isn't currently the resource in building control to make the verifications we need on our buildings that are being built right now? But what I'm saying, Convener, is that I recognise that there needs to be investment in building control in Scotland, uh, and that is why I have allowed for an increase in fees uh, and would expect local authorities to put in additional investment into their building standards um, uh, uh, sections within councils. Um, I think that, you know, it, this is uh, an area, um, and having been a uh, a former councillor myself. Uh, this is uh, an area uh, where there has probably not been due attention paid by elected members at local authority level uh, to ensure uh, that their building standard <coughs> services are fit for purpose in doing the job right. I think that Cole has given us all the opportunity to reflect on that, and I would hope that councillors across the country uh, will pay due attention and will scrutinise much more uh, their building standard service and to ensure um, that it is capable of carrying out the job that it, it should be. A couple of supplementaries, first Joanne, then Cole, and then Claire Adams. I mean, just a couple of, of reflections before I ask my question. It does seem to me that Mr Dodds is saying there are scant resources, not just to have high standards, but to ensure they're applied. You yourself have said that building standards was the Cinderella service. Perhaps a decision of the Scottish Government to target local government cuts has been proven to be mistaken. I mean, that's just, and I hope that when you're talking about investment in local government, there will be a, a, a commitment in that regard. And also, we've got all this complexity around um, the Futures Forum and all the checks and all the people. The fact of the matter is a wall fell down because somebody didn't put a wall tie on it and it didn't get picked up by anybody. And, and, and I, think, I think that, that really says there's something you know, beyond. There's, there are clearly issues around the way in which, because of PPP, people didn't take you know, ownership, if you like. But the basic, it's ve it seems to be very basic that it's possible to construct a building that's not safe and the bit that's the check and balance against poor workmanship is not picked up um, in the in the in inspection regime. So, the question I wanted to ask: one of the things that came out from evidence in the last couple of weeks is the necessity to police the construction industry because if you don't police it, they will cut corners. Surely that is profoundly depressing that we are ending up in a position where people will cut corners and create um, dangers for the want of a clacker 
it works checking them. And what are the proposals by the Scottish Government to make the construction industry safer and to create incentives for high quality construction with good workforce management and good, uh, and we're going to training later, but a culture which has led to levels of fatalities in the construction industry that are still shocking. So, I, I mean, do you accept this picture that the construction industry has to be policed so closely because left its own devices, it will build things that aren't safe? Convener, if I could just clarify um, one point that uh, Ms Lamont made. Um, the Scottish Futures Trust were not around when PPP1 um, oh, was on the go. And, you know, I, I think... Uh, what we have is a much more robust check uh, than there was uh, when there was PPP1, uh, which uh, of course was a, a number of years ago. In terms of the construction industry, uh, and we've talked about the holistic approach in dealing with all of this, um, I've already um, had a, a round table uh, with the uh, construction industry uh, and others um, following uh, the Co report. I was very pleased that Professor Cole himself um, you know, was able to attend a, a, an event which I hosted with a, a number of, of stakeholders. I've written to the construction industry. Um, I have met with the construction industry. And beyond that, um, we are following that up uh, with uh, a, a further uh, summit in September uh, to look across uh, all of the aspects of the construction industry's failings in this regard. Um, also, um, Construction uh, Scotland's industry leadership group are, are now actively coordinating the development of an industry-wide response to the report. Um, Ron Fraser, who's a, a retired director um, from Carillion PLC, is leading uh, on them uh, for that. Um, they recognise um, that um, they, there were failings. Um, they um, will uh, respond, as I have said, uh, and we will look uh, closely uh, at what they have to say uh, about these matters. I think it would be fair to say uh, that in terms of uh, coal itself, uh, many folk within the industry uh, were shocked by um, the findings of that report. I think, you know, we have got a, a real job of work to do um, in ensuring um, that standards are, are brought up uh, massively in, in some cases uh, and that, you know, everyone recognises, no matter who they are, um, that in terms of constructing uh, a building, completing a project, that has got to be done absolutely right. But we, I mean, would you no, accept... No, 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 it was just a supplementary stuff. I need to take call on now. Just, just uh, leading on from what uh, John Lamont was saying, I, I think it's absolutely atrocious that subcontractors in particular exploited uh, failures in the system in order to presumably cut costs and maybe even t take on unskilled workers and so on to do these jobs, which presumably saved them money. To restore credibility, are we go are, would you agree that these subcontractors who put at risk the lives of, of children in schools and so on should not be allowed to bid for work again in the public sector? Um, Convener, um, I'm going to take in Mr. Bell, and I'll, I, I want to clarify a point. Thank you. Um, the exclusion of um, of contractors or subcontractors within public contracts has has been strengthened um, with the regulations or the Act that was passed in uh, 2000. Uh, sorry, regulations in 2015. Um, that, that means that we can take into account past performance um, against contracts. Um, I, I'm not aware of examples of that per se coming forward. Um, there would be an element within there of um, a test that would be required in terms of whether um, when we would exclude a contractor from a public procurement, um, there's potential for a legal challenge and test within that. I'm not aware of any situations where that has arisen yet. Um, however, the regulations have been changed so that we can exclude uh, contractors based on but elements surely of Surely the test is very simple. If they built substandard, clearly deliberately, 
then they should not again be let loose on a public contract. Can, 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 I, can I come in at this point? I think that part of the problem here would be that uh, contractors subcontract and you don't know who to subcontract. Would that be in the main? I mean, because sometimes what you're doing is you're getting a couple of joiners in or uh, not criticising joiners, but, you know, any, yeah. any tradesperson in to do something, and I doubt very much that you and would the have system needs to foresight of that. Convener, um, as Mr Bell has said, some of these changes are, have already been made. We will look carefully at what um, Mr Beatty has said. But I think another uh, thing that came up in the report, and often, you know, subcontracting is to individuals yeah, um, exactly. rather than, than companies. Uh, and one of the things which was picked up in the report um, was the way that some subcontractors are actually paid. Um, if you look at the report where it talks about the way that um, bricklayers are paid uh, uh, in terms of piecework, you know, how many bricks they actually uh, uh, lay, um, you know, and obviously adding in the ties takes more time. Yeah, Mr. Um, so Cole I think, I think point, yeah. you know, in terms of looking at the way that the industry itself uh, pays people uh, and deals with that, it's something that, you know, I have great interest in uh, and will continue to raise with the industry because at the end of the day, I don't think that works. I don't think that works. Um, and, you know, I, I think that needs to be resolved. Okay, thank you. Claire? Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, Joanne Lamont mentioned um, funding for local councils, but obviously councils now have the flexibility to use council tax in cases to, to fund such services. I'd just like to ask the Minister if that's he'd like to see some of that funding diverted to building control investment. Um, and the other question I wanted to ask, I've come as a substitute member today, so I haven't been involved in a lot of the evidence sessions, but what I would just like to ask the Scottish Future Trust and the Minister is... Today, if a school was procured, are you confident that the systemic failures that we have witnessed have been minimised? Uh, let me deal with, um, with, with your last point first. Um, I think they have been minimised and obviously uh, working with the Scottish Futures Trust, um, within government uh, our procurement services um, and with building standards, we will continue to do all that we can to minimise that even further. Um, and, you know, that um, uh, I can assure you of. In terms of raising council tax to invest in, uh, in building standards, um, Councils shouldn't have to do that in terms of, of building standards uh, because the income from building standards uh, to the council um, is normally much, much greater um, than the investment that goes into building standards services by councils. Now, I don't have uh, all of the figures in front of me here, convener, about how much income local authorities take uh, and how much they're investing back in their uh, building standards, but I'm more than willing to write to the committee um, with that information. Uh, but I would reiterate the income that they take in is normally much more than what they're spending on the service itself. So before we move on uh, to Claire Hockey, I would just like some clarification. We're going back to what we started with in this section about building standards. How do, how do you sign off something? I mean, is, is there a, almost like a tick box where, you know, the ties have been put in, somebody signs off to say, yes, we put the ties in. So therefore, does that mean then that when you've signed off something, there's a record of who has said that that safety aspect or that building aspect has been done. So therefore, you can quite clearly go back and say, that's a problem there. They told me that was done. That's their responsibility. Mr. Dodds will come in on that, convener. Yeah. Um, you asked for short answers. This may not be necessarily a short answer. As, soon as, as short as I can. <laughs> Mr. Dodds. Yeah. Well, just to answer, following on from what the minister said about funding there, what we have found as I've went round councils that the councils who fund their building standard services uh, uh, probably they're the, they're the council's departments that seem to be performing the best. You know, so the investment that's going in is shown in their service, and so the councils that were awarded the six-year six contracts or, 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 or the period of um, for being a, a verifier, you tend to find that the money that's going in there has been invested in the service and, and it's running pretty smoothly. 
And the, and the corollary to that is that uh, the ones who don't invest so well are the ones that seem to have some difficulty, and those are the ones that we have targeted, and that's, that's part of the ongoing process to try and make sure that local authorities are investing those funds within their services to, to get that consistent level of approach across Scotland. As far as signing off, the inspection plan I mentioned earlier there does, does set out the key stages that, that should be inspected, and it's incumbent on the building standards surveyor to tick those off that he's seen them, and at the end of the day, they sign off the completion certificate. So if you go into a local authority now, you should be able to ask for the CCNP or the plan, pull it out, have a read through it, see when it was inspected, who inspected it. There'll be a computer record of that as well. So that you, from now on, I would have confidence that, or I would hope that if you went into a local authority for a new school, you would see a, a completion, a CCNP, a process there that you can then work your way through and see the number of inspections, what was looked at and what day, and, and then that gives the comfort for the surveyor to sign it off at the end. You know, so, um, and again, what I would say is with resources, some authorities will have the luxury of being able to inspect a bit more than others, and what we're trying to do is level that playing field to get the same level of consistency across Scotland as far as that's concerned. A, a small point, but I think it's a, an important one. Um, the government uh, invested in e-building standards, which is an IT system which uh, now allows local authorities to connect. M most of these systems were um, paper-based systems, it has to be said, in local authorities. Now we have the ability, if um, uh, an, uh, an authority is having some difficulties, we can use expertise from other authorities um, to help them out uh, in that regard. Um, Mr Dodds has, has rightly once again pointed out, you know, in terms of those authorities that are not doing quite so well, um, we have used Mr Dodds and his team to go in and give them help and advice. But it is up to the local authority themselves to decide what investment that they are putting in. Uh, and I would suggest, uh, you know, that those authorities um, that are not doing so well, um, that elected members there should look at the level of investment that's going in uh, and act accordingly. Yeah, I suspect that may well be mentioned in our report. Uh, Claire? Thank you, convener, and thank you to the panel for coming along this morning. I want to pick up on a theme that I'd uh, questioned the two previous panels uh, in this inquiry on, and that's in terms of um, whether the, the follow-up activity in relation to the specific problems identified in Edinburgh is considered to be adequate, and um, what action has been taken to monitor that activity? Um, convener, um, if I can start off with that, and then I will uh, bring in colleagues. Um, because um, from the very start of this, um, government uh, were straight on uh, to Edinburgh and also uh, to other authorities um, uh, to make sure um, that uh, everything was in place. Um, my predecessors uh, wrote uh, immediately after um, the situation uh, arose at Oxgang School um, uh, to all local authorities. Um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Education on the 27th of April after that um, asked for updates uh, and what was happening in that regard. Uh, and, you know, I could go on even down to the point of uh, when coal itself was published. Um, I uh, spoke to the Chief Executive of the City of Edinburgh uh, for assurance that works uh, had been carried out to, to comply with coal. Um, and uh, again, we wrote to all local authorities asking them to take cognizance of the report and to do the necessary inspections. Uh, and we've had help from the Scottish Futures Trust in terms of dealing with local authorities and other public bodies uh, in terms of, of, uh, of those things. I received uh, a letter um, yesterday from the City of Edim em Edinburgh Council um, uh, after prompting them at the meeting for again an update on what they have done. Um, convener, I am trying to find that letter within uh, the copious amount of notes that I have here, um, which I can't at this moment. Uh, but it was uh, around about um, the fire stopping aspects uh, of, of it. Um, I will share um, that letter uh, with the committee, uh, which should give you um, uh, some uh, degree of comfort in terms of, of the, the work that has been undertaken. 
Uh, thank you for that. And can I, can I ask whether you're able to give any comment on this? This is obviously an issue that's, that's uh, occurred in schools. But what assurance or reassurance we have that this is not an issue that is uh, that has been uh, has happened in other uh, procured buildings such as hospitals, community centres, and so on. Uh, convener, um, while we have concentrated here today on schools. Um, as I said, Scottish Futures Trust and colleagues across government have also been in touch with other public bodies um, to make sure uh, that they look at buildings that were procured around about that time um, with similar design and, and build. Uh, that includes the health service uh, and other public bodies. Uh, it may be wise, convener, for Mr Riki to come in to give you more depth uh, about uh, the work that has gone on by the SFT um, to, to ensure that we, we, we are, are safe in these regards too. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, so I led SFT's work in, in the wake of the closure of the schools in, in Edinburgh. And the reason that we were able to deploy a, a team to help out is that we have a, an in-house team with engineers, architects, surveyors, the relevant um, professionals in there that we supplemented quite quickly with an experienced and senior structural engineer um, working through these issues for, for nearly a year. Um, and we took a role of sharing the technical information from the City of Edinburgh Council with other public bodies to allow them to undertake their own assurance activities. You can imagine that the, the technical team at Edinburgh was rightfully very focused on dealing with the issues in the Council. And they were also faced with inquiries from all over Scotland and further afield asking them, what have you found? What does it mean for us? What should we be looking for? So we were able to act as a, as a single point of contact and the Edinburgh team made time to speak to, to our team. And, and we then shared the technical details with other local authorities and public bodies to allow them, as I said, to undertake their own assurance activities, which have been going on in some depth since then. Um, that included as I said, all local authorities and, and public bodies, the health service and others across Scotland. And um, it's been reported, I think, that the issue, and John Cole has said, is, is not likely to be limited to schools. So there have, I think, been areas of non-compliance found in, in other buildings, nothing anywhere near as serious as, as, as in Edinburgh schools. But that assurance activity has been undertaken by individual authorities that own and maintain buildings, and they will be following up on, on, on any non-compliances that are found. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. It follows on somewhat from it. I'm still trying to get my head around the process that's followed in the immediate aftermath of an incident. So the incident we had at Ox Gangs was the wall fell down. A visual inspection was carried out, pupils were sent back into the school, and it was only later, once the deeper inspections had been carried out, that the school was closed once again. My understanding is that that process, to immediately go to a visual inspection, um, that was the, the agreed process that was followed. Was that a locally agreed process, or is there, are there national guidelines or a nationally agreed process for what you do in the aftermath of incidents like this? Um, it would be very difficult to write a set of guidelines that cover every single incident that could happen in what are very complicated structures with both structural elements, mechanical and electrical services, and so on and so forth. So there are no national guidance that I'm aware of that say, in case of finding an issue with wall ties, you must do the following thing. What, what happened was that the, the, the technical teams on the ground did their immediate response based on what they'd seen. And as they uncovered more of the issues, and it's been reported that the, the issues around header ties became clear as, as other schools were inspected, that then, as the ripples spread, the response spread, and, and different authorities um, based their assurance on what had been found in Edinburgh. So whilst I agree that it might be good to have a sort of handbook that you can turn to the right page for every sort of incident, I think there's too many variables so it would be impossible to do that. And the right thing to do is to have um, agreements in place and arrangements in place with qualified professionals who are able to respond appropriately at the time. And, and Edinburgh, I, I know, and their, and their contractor did deploy those professional teams very quickly. I understand entirely what you're saying about the, the range of incidents, the, the range of scenarios to plan for, and it would be impossible to come up with a comprehensive list of responses. But 
it does seem to me quite unsatisfactory that in response to a wall collapsing, a visual inspection was carried out, and it was only after that that a decision was made to go for deeper inspection. A school was reopened before being closed again because more significant issues were found. It doesn't seem like a satisfactory response, and yet, as far as the Education Authority was concerned, it was the correct response. Convener, I think that in terms of immediate processes when something like this occurs, I think we need to, to reflect on that. Um, I, I agree with um, Mr Greer in terms of uh, wanting to see, uh, or as best we can, uh, a process which takes full account very quickly uh, and assesses risk very quickly um, so that action, necessary action um, can be taken. Now, um, I, will, I will look again at that aspect of that visual inspection and the, the further inspection, how long that took, uh, and whether you know something else should have, uh, have been put in place in that regard. Most of this is, of course, a matter for local authorities, but I understand your real concern around about that, and I will reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, at an earlier um, committee session, Paul Mitchell from the Scottish Building Federation um, expressed grave concerns about the dilution of skills that were being planned around uh, construction apprenticeships, um, uh, raised the question of unilateral action by the SQA in redefining what some of these courses were. I think we've already heard the importance of the autonomy of the, the, the craft person in the building trade. I've got friends who work in the construction industry and I think you know, workers in the industry are very often put into circumstances which are not necessarily safe for them. And the trade unions have been highlighting this over a period of time. I wonder what the Scottish Government's response is to this question about the, the, the skills needed in the construction industry, the, the level of skill there, what you're going to do about that, but how do you address this concern, which I think must be a real concern, the SQA unilaterally, we are told, is making new decisions on apprenticeships which could have consequences in terms of the quality of work that's then produced in the construction trade later. Um, convener, uh, one of the best parts of the job that I have as Minister for Local Government and Housing um, is going to uh, a number of construction sites and seeing new housing going up. When I do that, um, I always take the opportunity um, to meet with apprentices. Um, because as far as I'm concerned, it's extremely important uh, that we get uh, young folk, men and women, into the construction industry uh, to make sure um, that we can deliver uh, for the future. Um, and I am always uh, asking them what they think of the quality um, of the training, uh, the college course, uh, and how um, they are being treated by their employers. Uh, and uh, most of them are not backward at in coming forward and telling you exactly what they think, and that's a good thing in my book. Um, convener, Ms Lamont makes a, a, a specific point. Can I say that there are no plans, no plans to dilute the level or quality of craft apprenticeships? Um, SVQ Level 2 qualifi qualifications in the sector were first accredited uh, in 1993. Uh, and different iterations of, of these qualifications ran until 2012. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, there were some changes at that point in time. CITB um, are currently re reviewing um, the Level 3 craft apprenticeship frameworks um, as the existing ones are due to expire in August, I believe. Um, Government facilitated a, a meeting of employers and stakeholders earlier on in the year, um, and you know we will continue um, to listen to what uh, CITB and others um, uh, are saying. So, following a consultation with industry by CITB, um, the skills test will be uh, built into the SVQ uh, to base to ensure uh, their independence, the quality of the SVQ, uh, and the apprenticeship going forward. And there is no plan change to the duration of craft apprentice apprenticeships in that proposed framework. So I hope that gives some assurance uh, to Ms. Lamont. Just to be clear, then, Paul Mitchell is wrong 
when he says that the SQE unilaterally has decided to dilute the courses and he has expressed concern on behalf of the industry. I mean, if he is wrong, I mean, that, that's I, I obviously something he's not aware of. I, I but don't... he was very critical. Okay. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure you'll have seen the, the, the passage in the official report. Very critical about his concerns about the SQE acting in this way. He also talks about the CITB not being helpful. And the reason it matters is because it would mean that the quality assurance on site, is, in his argument, would be reduced because the level of skill of people working there would be reduced. Um, convener, I would reiterate um, what I said previously. Um, there are no plans to dilute the level or quality um, of craft apprenticeships. Um, I will, um, uh, of course, um, continue uh, to talk to apprentices to see exactly what they think uh, uh, as well. Um, but, you know, um, you have the assurance that um, government wants to ensure that there are uh, folks entering this industry and craft apprenticeships are vital to ensure the future of the construction industry. So would it be an option for you then, I, mean, I know you've talked about various summits and so on, to bring together the Scottish Building uh, Federation with SQA and the CITB to actually thrash out some of these issues which clearly are a matter of such concern that they were brought before the committee. I, I will have a look at that, Convener. Uh, a number of these issues don't fall into my uh, ministerial portfolio, uh, but I will uh, certainly talk to colleagues about that issue. Thank you. Okay, in that, that case then, we will close the meeting. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> I'll try to finish early. Uh, <laughs> we will suspend the meeting for a few moments to allow the witnesses to leave. And can I thank you very much for your attendance this morning? Thank you very much, convener.